Hey, this is Jamie with Stillmeyer Games, and today I'm going to talk about my favorite mechanism, or mechanisms, because there's a lot to love about this game, in The King's Dilemma. This will be a spoiler-free conversation about this game. I have played through three scenarios with five total players so far, and so there's a lot for us to discover. I believe it's a 15-game campaign, um, but I, I won't be spoiling anything. I'm talking about core mechanisms here that you would know from reading the, the base rulebook out of the box or online. Uh, so one of the big things about this game that I really, really love is that it is a tug-of-war game. I love tug-of-war games, and it is a multiplayer tug-of-war game, specifically in that there are these tokens that typically start out in the middle of the board, um, or there are five tokens, middle of the board, or close to the middle of the board, and over the course of the game, you are making decisions, that I'll get into in a second, that manipulate those tokens either way on the track, either driving the kingdom to ruin or to prosperity, essentially. Um, and... You care about these tokens as players for a couple different reasons. Uh, one of them, and this is the thing that I really, really like, is that uh, every ra every game, each player secretly selects a card, um, kind of in a card draft format, uh, that determines your overall goal for these tokens during that game, but not referencing specific tokens. And this, is, I think, is the real brilliance behind it, uh, because... You, the, uh, an example of this would be a card that says that you want all tokens to be in the, the ruinous side of the track. All tokens. doesn't matter which tokens, all of them. Another one might be uh, all prosperity. Another that I had was have all tokens on the extremes of the track. So either uh, or to some tokens over here and some tokens over here or divided between the two as long as there are no tokens in the middle of the board. And there's one that wants tokens in the middle of the board. I love that you have these, these goals, reasons to manipulate these tokens throughout the game um, without referencing very specific tokens. And in doing that, uh, players also uh, don't have to meet all of those goals. So it's, it's kind of scaled. So it, the, one of the goals might say, like, if you have three tokens that meet your goal, like you want them all in the middle of the board. If you have three tokens in the middle of the board, you get a certain number of points. Um, but it's okay if you have some tokens outside of the board. It's, it's less points, but uh, you still get points for having gotten some of those tokens on there. So it's not an all or nothing um, endeavor there, which I really like. At the same time, each player, or each house has its own secret goals and that your house might want a specific token somewhere on the board. So even though specific tokens don't always matter, they do sometimes matter for the houses. That's the tug of war element. I really, really like that. The other side of the game that I really, really love, and this is, this is also the heart of the game, the heart of the decision points, the gameplay in the game, is that uh, on your turn, um, each round basically, it's not, it's not exactly turn based, but each round you are making a voting bidding style decision based on a, uh, something, a, a thematic card, an event card essentially, um, that also has thematic repercussions. So, for example, a random one that I'll think of off the top of my head is that the kingdom has decided to um, to give every person in the kingdom a cat, and you have to decide: do we want to um, do we want to do this? Do we want to pay for all these cats so everyone has their own cat, or do we want to not do this and maybe morale for the kingdom or leadership for the kingdom goes down a little bit? Um, and you don't know how how much. Uh, leadership will go down or, or, or the cost will go, uh, how much money you'll spend if you do this. You just know that that will be impacted. Um, and each player then makes a decision um, in, in turn order, starting with a leader. There's a leader token. Here's the leader token right there. So this player would go first and they would decide if they agree with this, if they want to pass the, the, the vote, if they want to uh, say nay, they, they don't want it, or if they just want to pass. So I use the, that term pass twice. I shouldn't have. It's either say yes to it, say no to it, or pass, and just abstain from the vote. Uh, and they do this, uh, they, they vote yes or no by placing power tokens, which are kept behind your little pa player shield. So I have coins and power tokens. You're placing power tokens on this card itself. So you're not just saying yes. You're saying yes, and this is how much I believe in it. So I might say yes and put two power tokens there. And then every player goes around the table, and if the, the leader token doesn't move, um, every player just gets one chance to vote. However, if another player places more power tokens or has more power tokens on either the yes or no cards, then the power token does move to them and it gives other players to come back in and overbid them later. However, one of the really cool things here, other than this being like more than just a yes or no vote, one of the cool things is that you can't change your vote. Once you say yes, that is your official stance. You can't waffle later and, and change your vote, but you can put more power tokens on the yes vote. The other neat thing here is 
At first, when I read about the game, I was like, okay, there's a pass option, but that doesn't seem all that exciting. But the game actually makes passing really exciting because sometimes someone else, say this player, has voted yes on something that I want uh, a yes vote on. And so I could outbid them and be like the, get the credit for that vote, but maybe I don't need to. Maybe I think that it's going to pass with a yes. I'll get what I want in terms of the tug of war track. And instead, I can just pass, let that thing happen, and I've passed for that round. I, I, I can't come back in. I can't say yes or no after that. I've chosen my decision. And in passing, I get a coin. I get a coin from the bank. Co coins end up being quite valuable because you can use them to bribe players. Or if no other player is selected at this round, you get the moderator token. And again, when I heard about this moderator token, early in the game, all of us were like, okay, well, who really cares about that? We'd rather get money than get the moderator token. But the moderator breaks ties. And this becomes a crucial position in this game for the bribing element I just mentioned. Because if we go around the table and say uh, the yes and no votes are, are tied, uh, which they can very easily be. It, it definitely happened quite a few times in our games. The moderator breaks the tie, making them a very bribable character, very, very bribable player. And so they can get a lot more money than just the one coin they could got, have got from passing because players are bribing them quite heavily. I've gone, I've basically explained how the game works here, but I just love this mechanism. I love this entire voting mechanism that is deeper than just yes or no, that passing has meaning, that there's a real reason to go after something that wouldn't otherwise be interested in the moderator and that you can be bribed um, once you're in that position. And you can even be bribed just to vote yes or no. Like I bribed someone not to vote at all when it came to be their turn because I thought, okay, I want to win this vote. I don't need their vote and I don't want them to vote against me. One other mechanism I want to mention briefly before I go to overtime here is uh, the event system in, in this game. I won't go into too many details, but the, the core idea is that you get some event cards at, at different times throughout the game. Like usually when a decision is made in one of these votes, it will unlock a few cards and those become, I, I forget exactly what they're called, but they're essentially event cards. And what you do is you shuffle them into the existing deck, thin deck of event cards, and they go under a tile. You're never drawing from the top of the deck because the cards are double-sided. So you have this tile that kind of blocks the deck. You're always drawing from the bottom of the deck, which I wanted to mention because that is really cool that uh, it, it's a way to have double-sided cards, but it's still conceal information by having that tile on top of the deck. But the other thing I really like about this is that the events, uh, because you're shuffling them into previous events, the story that you are telling, the decisions that you are making in your game are going to be very different than in any other game that is played of The King's Dilemma. Not that that really matters, but I just love the variability. I love that it, there, there are story, important story and plot points happening, but they're happening probably in a very unique order to your experience. And we even, like, by the time we had our third game, late in the third game, we had an event card come up that I think was probably in there at the very beginning or very early on in the first game. And that... Uh, just having that come up, it, it made me feel like something very different was happening in our game because that, th that event had been delayed for a while in terms of how, when we were actually going to see it. So I think this was the game was successful in, in pulling that off by having a, a very thin event deck. So you're still going to see most of those cards. And they have uh, thematic event cards that, that uh, direct the story in a certain direction, but still have the shuffling element where you don't know exactly when those events are going to happen. Um, and you might have some events from the past or earlier games come up that are still relevant in the kingdom right now. Anyway, I've, went, I've gone long in this video because this is a really cool game. I, I was really excited by my first three games of it, and I look forward to playing it some more. And uh, yeah, I just thought those were some really cool mechanisms to discuss. If you've played The King's Dilemma and have some non-spoiler favorite mechanisms to discuss in the comments, I'd love to hear your thoughts below. Or if any of these mechanisms remind you of another game that you want to discuss in the comments below, I'd love to hear about that as well. Thanks.